Strap on your earbuds, ladies and gents. You're listening to a full Monty version of Broken Boner Radio. Don't feel down if you can't get it up. We all need to find the fun in being dysfunctional. It can be brutal if you've got a limp noodle. Getting hard is hard to do, but we're here for you. It's Broken Boner Radio. Here's your host, Daniel Canfield. Some of you who know me know that putting humble in front of my name doesn't necessarily fit, but I have to admit today I am extremely humbled and honored because my guest today is Dr. Erwin Goldstein, my go-to medical professional at Broken Boner Radio and on my website at danielcanfield.com. And doctor, I want to welcome you to the show. Daniel, it's a supreme honor and pleasure. Uh, it's amazing what you're doing to basically, I guess, liberate people and empower them to speak about this. It's such a common health problem. It's such a nightmare problem. Actually, yesterday I got a phone call from an 18-year-old who uh, wow. is already experiencing erectile dysfunction, and you know that quite well. So it's in all age groups. It's very prevalent, and it's one of the things we don't talk about. So I congratulate you for doing this, and where it may be an honor for me to be here, it's an honor for me to be working with you to get the word out. I think it's very important. Well, I'm, I just feel so blessed that, that you and your wife, Sue, and the whole team at San Diego Sexual Medicine, of which you are the director of, uh, is, is, uh, we're kind of joining forces here. It's, it's just really exciting. And who knows what the future holds in this. Tell me a little bit about San Diego Sexual Medicine. You're the director. You're also a world-class urologist, surgeon, and all of that. But tell me a little bit about your mission at San Diego Sexual Medicine. Uh, it's my dream. <laughs> I've been dreaming about this for years. It's a 6,000-square-foot uh, facility that addresses sexual dysfunction in both men and women in a biopsychosocial environment. We have a physical therapist who does musculoskeletal examinations for an hour. We have a sex therapist who does psychologic assessment and counseling as, as needed for an hour. We have a biologic assessment, so I have myself. I have uh, fellows uh, who are your typically urologists uh, after training. I have nurse practitioners and physician assistants. And uh, we do typically an hour of biologic testing, which would engage hormonal testing, neurologic testing, vascular testing. And our mission is really to listen, understand, uh, diagnose, treat human beings with, with bothersome sexual health problems. And it's such an amazing field, sexual medicine, and it's not well addressed by the healthcare profession. So the dream was to put this together. Uh, one of the amazing parts of my life is I work with a hospital, Alvarado Hospital here in San Diego, that has me director of sexual medicine in the hospital, and it, uh, my name tag says sexual medicine, and that's a pretty rare phenomenon. Really? In, in, in medicine, yeah. My, wow. my name tag, and my fellow who just started in August, she got her name tag, sexual medicine. and <laughs> It's very exciting that that is recognized by a hospital because it's really not around in this country. Well, I'm certainly very familiar with your staff and, and with you and, and the miracles that you provide. I wanted to get into our history, our relationship as, as doctor-patient. I don't know if you know this. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> my listeners know that I was born with erectile dysfunction, and uh, you diagnosed me, oh gosh, it's been six or seven years ago, as having corporal erectile tissue fibrosis, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But having lived my entire adult life with erectile dysfunction. Several years ago, I got to the point where all my treatments that I, you know, Viagra, you know, I did the penile pump, the penis pump, all that kind of stuff. And then I did Viagra and then that started to not work as well. And I had seen somebody on TV years ago. I think it was a Phil Donahue show. If, I don't know if you remember that show, but there was a guy on there, I think that said he had a penile implant and I remembered that. So I went online. I don't know if you know this. I went online and I started looking for penile implant surgeries to see what that was about. Because I assumed it was like this really gory, you know, slice and, you know, flambe my penis like, <laughs> you know. Well, Daniel, the, the, the interesting aspect to our medical management of uh, erectile dysfunction is that in 1973, okay, so I don't know how many years that would be. It's be 43 years ago, I guess. That 
penile implant was described and utilized and published, and it was uh, an event. I mean, it's way before Viagra, it's way before Shines, mm-hmm. it's way, you know, it, it precedes every therapy. And it just wasn't publicized, wasn't utilized by many healthcare providers. But the only true reason I'm in this field of sexual medicine is. In 1976, so that's three years later, uh, I, I actually participated in a surgery as I was an intern, so I just sort of participated way down the chain. But it, to me, it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen, and I said, that's what I'm going to do with my life. Wow. <laughs> so it was, it was the excitement that you could take a gentleman uh, with this just miserable situation, erectile dysfunction, and... Uh, less than an hour surgical procedure reestablish his potency. It was it was totally amazing to me and really fostered this whole association. So this is fascinating to me because as our lives were on tra- on these two tracks in the universe, and I became sexually active in 1974. Oh, really? Cool. One year later. <laughs> yeah, and I, I knew I was my first sexual experience was one of being completely limp. Oh boy. Yeah. And, and it's interesting to me to know that you were an intern back then. <laughs> Penile implant surgeries were just being introduced to the to the world. And here I am struggling. And of course, back then, nobody, I mean, in the general public, I, I'm sure in the medical circles it was talked about, but in the general public and in the media and stuff, nobody talked about erectile dysfunction. There was nothing. Yeah. Of course, the big event that popularized the condition was the, the development of an oral medication, a safe and effective right. sort of relatively simple medication. That's 1998. Right. If you go from 1974 to 1998, you're looking at a whole bunch of years, 24 years. So the crazy part is how I found you is here I am. I've lived most of my adult life, especially well, my whole sexual life, dysfunctional and, and dealing with it the best I could. And I finally was like, I got into the Viagra and all that. And I went online and looked up penile implant surgeries. And lo and behold, this video pops up <laughs> of an actual surgery. And you were the surgeon. You you were, there was a panel, if I remember correctly, it was you and one or two other doctors sure. talking about the implant surgery. And I watched it. And I was, I was amazed. Like you, you mentioned earlier, it's less than an hour long surgery. We do in and around 30,000 implants a year now for 43 years. So there's millions of people who have undergone the procedure. It has a success rate in the 80 to 90% range, which for surgery is pretty pretty high. Wow. But there are people for whom it doesn't help, and we can talk about all that. And it's completely revolutionized the field. I mean, we have, when we deal with men now, with this horrible condition. The ace of the hole is the penile implant. We should go what's called step care medical management from simple to complicated, from least invasive to most invasive. And we have to put the implant as the most invasive. But as you go through the, and you, you've you gone through this, so it's not a it's not, yep. a, it's not a, a complicated conversation for you. You've been through this. But as you go through the various treatments and you, you know, keep on failing and failing, at least we know that at the end of the day, we have something, you know, uh, at the end of the line, uh, 80 to 90% death rate, the penile implant. Yeah. And and that's exactly where I, I came to. And it- I have to tell you this cute story. So yesterday, a gentleman walks in the office. He had a year and a half out from his penile implant. And it completely revolutionized his life uh, as it does in many patients. Like as it has mine. Absolutely. And he says his implant broke. And he was heartbroken. I mean, if you saw his face, he just put his hands on his face, put his head down and said, I cannot believe this happened. You know, I've had this all for many years. Now I've resolved it. And he broke it? The thing broke at a year and a half. And he came in and I said, you know, I hadn't examined him yet. And I said, you know, you're, you're going to have to get this thing fixed again. I mean, it's another operation. You're going to have to scrub for seven days beforehand. You're going to take the antibiotics for three days. You know the drill. I remember the drill. So yep. It was the most sad, defeatist picture. And I then brought him in the exam room. I said, let me examine you. And his pump was full as opposed to the pump being empty. When devices fell, fail because of a leak, the fluid drains out. So the pump system is void of fluid, so it's empty. And his pump was completely full. So a big smile on my face. He basically had a little air bubble 
that entered uh, the system or something. I don't. I, I can't tell you what it was, but I just played with the device, got the air bubble out, <laughs> and the thing worked again. And it was like looking at a man who had just won the Olympic gold medal. I mean, he just had this big smile on his face. He's back to being potent again. Or the dog that you found really their fetch toy. Amazing story. <laughs> So within a space of like five minutes, he went oh from this God. deflated thing to, to this erect thing and his face and his mood. Oh, my God. Changed. It's crazy. Well, I couldn't imagine when you said he broke it because I, you know, I mean, I'm I use mine all the time and. I mean, I've been pretty rough on it at times. and <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're pretty durable. And they last uh, up to a decade, I would say, in most cases. So I was very shocked that he, at a year and a half he, he had come in. But he did. And, and I mean, it wasn't because it had a leak or was officially broken. It's actually the, it's a technical name called pseudo-malfunction, meaning that it feels like a malfunction but really isn't. And it's easily managed. And bless America, he's back, back doing his thing. Wow. Again, you did my surgery. And, and again, it was life changing for me and for my wife, for our marriage. Uh, it's it's part of the reason I've got this platform now. It, it is completely I, I have a lot much deeper narrative uh, beyond just the sexual dysfunction part of my life, but also understanding how it shaped my masculinity and my feelings about myself as a man. And I'm bringing that message to the world as well. I'm thrilled. And honored to, to work with you doing this. Uh, uh, having somebody like you out there, I think it's going to be very helpful to a lot of people. Thank you. I have a very similar mission to you. We're going to fix a lot of broken boners and a lot of broken brains out there in females that don't understand what's going on. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Yeah, your message about this being the couple is very important. Yeah, I know it's it's about a man and, and his, uh, you know, his sexual dysfunction, but it's usually expressed in a couple and we have so much data now to show how this positively influences the relationship, the couple's sexual function. So it's sort of an interesting physiology. Uh, uh, I don't know if you totally appreciate this. Like, I can do something to you, a surgery, and now you're you're staring at your, your fabulous partner, who I love to death, and uh, I can change her physiology with no treatment to her. <laughs> I can show you that she'll have mud more blood flow to her vagina, her clitoris will engorge more, her arousal uh, will increase, her orgasmic activity will increase, her desire for sex will increase. I had done nothing to her. It just goes to show you how you change the physiology of a sexual thing, you change the physiology of the partner. That's pretty fascinating yeah. uh, if you wow. think about it. I, you can't do much to someone else without physically treating them. But in right. sexuality, which is a shared event, with couples, you can actually change the physiology of someone else by changing the physiology of the male. And you can do it for females too. It, it works in the other way. Women who have pain, men have erectile dysfunction. And, and if you change the pain uh, situation for a woman, her pain goes away. The man was erectile function will return. And we have these, these data documented. Well, that's the amazing thing that as I started to you know do this work and interview people, I, I at first my mission was I thought, okay, this, my site, Broken Boner Radio, everything's going to be specifically for a safe place for men to come to learn about erectile dysfunction. And I wasn't weeks into talking to people and I realized, holy cow, there's dysfunction in women too, uh, their own sexual dysfunctions of which you talked about. But there's also the mental part of when a man fails. And, and we'll get into that a little bit later in our conversation. But my platform has broadened to, it, it's everybody, you know, men and women suffer dysfunction and, and women suffer dysfunction from erectile dysfunction. A lot of it's mental and it hits their insecurities and stuff. Yesterday was a very emotional day for me, Dr. Goldstein, because I interviewed my wife. Wow. I interviewed Stacy. She agreed. It was, it was hard. She was nervous. She didn't want to be too transparent about our sex life. But I actually had uh, one of my other guests who's a relationship coach and professional stand-up comedian actually Ironically, we kind of had a three-way on the interview. <laughs> Elaine Williams kind of interviewed Stacy and I. She was the one she put on her relationship coach hat and interviewed both Stacy and I. And we talked more in, in deep narrative about what it was like to communicate and love each other through a lifetime together. We've been together, our 20-year anniversary is coming up, of what it's like for both of us to manage going through erectile dysfunction together. So it was a very, very 
touching uh, interview for me. Let me propose you bring my wife, Sue, on, who will – she's a sexuality educator. and She can actually provide insight uh, to the female brain when a male has – erectile dysfunction and other things and her own uh, sexual dysfunction. So I think I would I'll, love to have her I'll, on the show. I'll encourage Sue to get involved. <laughs> awesome. So I'm curious, in, in my treatments, I came to you because I saw the surgery and I walked into your office. This was probably 2010, roughly. I don't have your chart in front of me, but it seems like it's been a few years, yes. Because my surgery was 2012, September of 2000 or August. Of it would make sense in that time frame, yes. And I remember walking in and I basically said, hey, I saw you do a surgery. I, I mean, I was shocked when I got at the end of that video and I looked and it said, Dr. Goldstein, San Diego, California. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. He's right here. <laughs> I find you on the internet and you're here. But I walked into your office like, I want an implant. And you, t you basically grabbed my reins and said, slow down, cowboy. You know? <laughs> and I really appreciate that. Um, that told me a lot about your integrity and being thorough. And you ran me through a battery of tests, you know, the blood tests and all of that. And you, know, you basically said, you're not ready for an implant yet. There's other treatments out there that we need to try before we do the implant. I remember you saying the implant is always there. And there's no backing up from an implant. That's that's the 100% you're all in. You know, that's how you're going to live the rest of your life. And it's great, but let's try these other things first. I mean, there's a technical term for it. And, you know, if you think about a condition like arthritis, you start with the aspirins and those types of things. You then go to injections of pain medicines or steroids. And then eventually you get into the hip replacement situation. So it's called step care. It's, it's, it's called a process of care. And it essentially goes from the least invasive to the most invasive. It's pretty standard for all of medicine. And we apply it to sexual dysfunction, including erectile dysfunction. Now, explain. I, I've, I've done the best in my layman's terms to ex, to explain what my can do. You diagnosed me with corporal erectile tissue fibrosis. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I mean, the, the penis is one of the most unique organs on earth. In the flaccid state, the tissue, which is mostly muscle, people don't understand that, but you're basically carrying a bag of muscle uh, between your legs. And, and the muscle does, like all other muscles, one of two things. It either contracts or it relaxes. And if you think about uh, wringing a sponge, it's sort of a good analogy. The sponge is the least large, the least full of fluid when it's contracted. And, and uh, it seems odd that when you're totally relaxed and your penis is flaccid, that means the muscle is contracted. You, you, nobody sort of thinks that your muscle is active while you're totally relaxed, but that's the actual situation. So it's kind of opposite of what you think it would be. Yeah, it's sort of an opposite thing. I mean, you have a full, rigid, you know, a completely a solid, like morning wood erection. Your muscle is completely, totally relaxed, which also doesn't sound very intuitive, but it actually makes more sense. I mean, when is a sponge mostly full of fluid? When it's completely relaxed versus wringing it dry. So you have a muscle and it contracts and it relaxes, but it has to expand the tissue within its wall. The wall is called the tunica because at the edge of the erectile tissue are the draining veins. So if you think of the penis in the flaccid state and the muscle contracted, blood enters and blood exits through the veins at the periphery, just underneath the wall. But if the tissue expands, and the erectile tissue is able to push against the wall, then those draining veins get compressed. And that's the unique feature of the penis. There's no organ in the man and no organ in the woman at all that has what we call a closed compartment. When the penis is erect, blood enters, can't really escape. So you get a hydraulic pressurized system. But it depends upon the tissue being able to expand when you're sexually aroused. So if you replace the muscle by scar tissue, it's sort of like an elastic band that, that gets very stiff. You can't really stretch it. And if the erectile tissue can't expand, it can't compress, close those draining veins at the peripheral edge of the tissue. The bottom line is erectile tissue that's scarred is not consistent with function. It's consistent with blood leaving without your permission kind of thing. Right. So the irony of that is, is the tissue actually gets hard and dysfunctional, <laughs> but your penis does not. <laughs> the right. erection does not happen because the tissue's actually kind of gotten brittle and can't do what it's supposed to do. Yeah, I don't know what, what a good analogy would be, but something that's er erection tissue that's stiffer than normal 
has a mechanical term called ec- a poor expandability. That's the actual technical mechanical term. Right. So stiffer tissue is mechanically poorly expandable, which leads to a non-stiff pneumonia. <laughs> I guess stiffer the, tissue means a not so stiff dick. <laughs> it's crazy. You can get erectile tissue fibrosis through genetic uh, issues, which is what you have. Yeah. The interesting part about this being genetically handed down, my son, Ryan, who's 30, is also now a patient of yours. And he was also, I interviewed him. We have a whole episode with me talking to Ryan and going back through his history. So, so talk to me about the genetic predisposition for this uh, condition and also how prevalent can it be in men? Is this something that men will begin to experience as they get older? Is it a similar type of dysfunction that happens just from aging? Yeah, lots of great questions there, Daniel. <laughs> as bad as it is for a 50, 60, 70 year old man to have erectile dysfunction, uh, it's sort of an accepted concept that it is a condition that is associated with aging. It's relatively rare up until age 40. And then it sort of expands going forward. So at age 50, interestingly enough, 50% of men have erectile dysfunction. It's actually as common to have the condition as it is to, to be without the condition when you're age 50. At age 60, uh, 60% of men have erectile dysfunction. It keeps going up. 70% of men at age 70. So it's easy to, to remember the prevalence data. It's pretty unusual in a younger population. So your son Ryan has a condition that is unusual. It's not always explained by genetic erectile tissue scarring. There are many other reasons for this, uh, and in particular, psychological reasons uh, need to be uh, addressed. But that's the whole purpose of having, like a San Diego Section Medicine facility, we address it through all the various potential causes so that within one visit, although it's a four-hour visit, we can uh, sort of come to grips with what the major reasons are. You brought out the issue of uh, scarring as aging. It's what tissues do as they age. You know, your lung will get more scarred, your heart muscle will get more scarred, your liver will get more scarred, your kidney will get more scarred. That's that's the nature of aging. The, the functional units essentially die as we get older and those functional units get replaced by by scar tissue. So in the lung, there's a a thing called an alveolus where air is exchanged. Firemen who breathe in uh, smoky uh, air injure those alveoli and they get a thing called pulmonary fibrosis, which is, you know, it's the equivalent of erectile tissue fibrosis. A stiffer lung is not much fun either. You can't, it's harder to breathe. So that's one of the things that I talk about when I speak from stage and, and I've had the honor and pleasure of speaking in front of men's groups. And one of the claims I made was, you know, I was born with erectile dysfunction and I had a bunch of millennials in the audience, young guys, my son's age and younger. And I said, guys, you need to get used to the fact that you're all, we're all headed there. Most of us at some point in our lifetime, barring, you know, diabetes, uh, prostate cancer, things that are, you know, really cause severe and almost immediate dysfunction. But I said, if you're a normal, healthy guy, as you age, we're all headed there. And you better get used to it because what I have begun to understand is a misconception that a lot of men, especially young men have is, well, I'm, I'm a stud. I can get hard at a drop of a hat Uh, in my twenties. I'm always going to be that way. And when they start to get a little older, even in their thirties and forties, and they start to see a little decrease in their uh, productivity, so to speak, it's like, what the hell's going on with me? I was a stud when I was 20. I'm supposed to be, I'll be this my whole life. And that's not true. Correct. There are men who, rare as they may be, who don't have erectile dysfunction. But I think your message is is, is outstanding. I mean, it used to be that when you got erectile dysfunction, you had to live with it. But, but times have changed. We we know a lot now. There's a lot of physiologic appreciation. A lot of research has gone into this. And go see a doctor. <laughs> is the bottom line. Exactly. Like nut up, guys, and go see a doctor. That was we're we're going to get into that a little bit later. So, doctor, I have a question too. Um, you and I had the pleasure of uh, we were interviewed on Telemundo uh, TV station, and oh, I remember. Remember. that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I remember that, and it, it was funny because the episode when it aired was all in Spanish, and I don't speak Spanish. I'm like, what the? I mean, I could hear me talking in English, but it was dubbed over in Spanish. But I remember in that. Well, yeah, you know, getting back to how I got into the field and how you got into this field, the penile implant. I mean, Telemundo was about El Chapo, the, the sort of uh, criminal 
Yeah, that Ooh, freaked God. me out. <laughs> that seriously, Doctor G, that freaked me out. I'm sitting there watching the episode. I'm like, wow, okay, this is really cool. And this was kind of really another like kind of message from from heaven or from the universe that I'm supposed to be doing this. You know, talking about erectile dysfunction and getting the word out. And so I'm watching this interview with this very sweet lady from uh, Telemundo, and all of a sudden. And again, it's all in Spanish, so I don't know what they're talking about. There's a picture of El Chapo on there. And I'm like, okay, I was just on this show, and now right next to me, the next scene up is a picture of El Chapo and something about an implant. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm, I'm at one degree separated <laughs> from the most famous drug lord. Yeah, he came to TJ for his implant after having escaped jail. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I guess all people get uh, erectile dysfunction. It doesn't matter. So I had a question because in that interview – uh, they showed you holding, and I, I remember the apparatus. There's, you have this little thing with four different little spongy, uh, long cylinders on them that are decreasing degrees of firmness, and that's kind of like your grades. And obviously, the limp one is erectile dysfunction. But can erectile this or a form of erectile dysfunction be categorized in? You know, you could have ED and get like semis all the time, but never get really hard. It, would that be considered some? Yeah. So let me go over those. Uh, we, we have pretty much in every room in the office uh, a, a what we call erection hardness scale (EHS) erection hardness scale, which is four rods that are vertically placed. They're, they're uh, uh, grade four is the official hard uh, erection. Uh, that is sustained throughout the sexual activity uh, uh, consistent with. So I have all patients feel these four rods. I'm pretty sure I asked you to do oh, the yeah. erection. Scale also. You press down and the number four is consistent without an erectile dysfunction. So three is sufficient for vaginal penetration, but just isn't the same as the hard erection. So that's number three. That is erectile dysfunction. Now, we would call that mild erectile dysfunction. Okay. Uh, grades two and one are not sufficient for uh, penetration, but grade two is close, <laughs> but it does buckle too much during penetration. And grade one, as you said, is the limp one. So if you think of the grades as without sexual dysfunction, grade four, grade three is mild, grade two is moderate, and grade one is the severe version of erectile dysfunction. So grades three, two, and one are ED, and grade four is without uh, ED. Okay, so that's a good thing, men, uh, listeners, and, and lady listeners that have a mate out there. You know, if it's not hard, hard all the time or semi-hard, th that could be an indication, you know, go see a doctor, you know, and, and what's, you know, what are the top three causes of erectile dysfunction that you can think of? Well, I, let's answer it this way. So we, we always address any sexual dysfunction from erectile dysfunction to libido problems, to orgasmic problems, to pain issues, to curvature issues uh, as biopsychosocial. So there is uh, usually a component of feeling awful and miserable and frustrated, and that would be the psychological issue. And there could be partner relationships, religious issues, uh, on and on, mood issues, uh, medication issues that are related to mood issues. And then a musculoskeletal, you know, you could have uh, just uh, a hip issue or a back issue uh, that distracts you during sexual activity. That, that is also the cause. So let's, let's just say we recognize the existence of psychosocial and musculoskeletal concerns. But let's now focus on the biologic ones. Biologic ones are extremely common and you know, work in conjunction with the, the psychosocial and musculoskeletal and, and the really independent concepts here. In the biologic world, we think of hormonal, neurologic, and vascular as really the uh, issues here. And uh, we assess them all, we examine them all, and we uh, identify what's wrong and try to correct it in, remember what we talked about, the step care, the process of care model that starts from least invasive to most invasive. And I remember what you did with me when I came in hell bent on having an implant was the first thing you did was I went out and did a bunch of blood tests. Yeah. So uh, it's common as one ages to, to have hormonal issues after sort of age 40. You're on the other side of the testosterone mountain. It, it, it typically falls in population studies. And, uh, testosterone is important to the health of the genital tissues, especially the smooth muscles of the penis that we talked about, the ones that contract and relax uh, to give you either flaccid or erect states. So it's important to, to get that. It's, it's a, 
it's one of the step care management ideas that if you start simple, so this would be a reversible form of an erectile dysfunction. If you had a hormonal issue, just treat the hormonal issue and that could deal with the erectile problem. That was actually one thing you discovered right away was when my blood test came back, my testosterone levels were really low. Yeah, I mean, it's part and parcel of the evaluation, and in a certain percentage of cases, replacing testosterone in a monitored fashion with biologically identical hormones uh, is a fabulous strategy. It doesn't work in all people, as, of course, nothing works in all people, but certainly some place to start with. Well, for me, and one thing I want to really touch on in this episode is you treated my testosterone levels. They were really low. My regular uh, doctor that I see once a year for my annual checkup said, well, you know, your testosterone levels are normal for a man your age. When you did the blood test and you looked at my testosterone levels, you said, well, okay, yeah, for a man your age, but you're at the bottom of the bottom of the chart. You said, we need to get you up here. Like mine was 270 or 240 something. Yeah, well, 300 is the official term of when it becomes normal abnormal. So if you were in the 200s, it's hard for someone to say you were normal. <laughs> right. But you you put me on testosterone treatments. And I have to share with you and the world, within three weeks, I felt like a new man. I felt more sexual. I felt more alive. I, I was able to get back to the gym and start working out. I started having a zest for life. My foggy head cleared up. Uh, it was a life changer for me just f from the hormone treatment. And the one thing I want to point to, you said it doesn't always help everybody with erectile dysfunction. It catapulted my arousal level through the roof. <laughs> I remember walking downstairs. Stacy, my wife, had. Uh, she always gets the Victoria's Secret catalog seen it a million times. It was like, oh, okay, cute. You know, at my age, it's like hot young women, but and I never really had a, much of a visceral response to it. It's sitting on the kitchen counter. I go to get in the refrigerator and I glance down. This is three weeks in of being on testosterone treatments. I got fully aroused. No erection because my other, my condition prohibits me from my penis reacting to my my mental and psychological arousal, my visceral arousal. And what I want to point out, doctor, and if you can back me up on this, there's a huge difference between arousal and erection. You're fabulously observing the stages of sexuality and uh, the, the component parts. And erectile function is just one of many activities that are happening when one is engaging in sexual activity. But, but let me just go backwards. Uh, the condition you describe and the condition that you had is called hypogonadism. So your gonad in, in the male is your testicle, and hypo means the, you have, uh, you know, reduced function of your testicle. It's a broad malfunction that, as you saw, engages your energy level, engages your muscle strength, engages your mentation and clarity of thinking and memory, it engages uh, sleep, it engages uh, a, a broad complement of issues, including sexual arousal and sexual drive. Uh, and even penile erection. But if you have an underlying biologic problem like stiff, stiffened or poorly expandable erectile tissue, the medicine, the testosterone, will help what it can, but it can't help what it can't help. And that's what I used to tell when in my single days. I would be fully aroused. I would be fully turned on. But women would look and see that I have a flaccid penis and they're like, baby, what's wrong? Am I not turning you on? Do I smell? Is it, am I not attractive? Am I not sexually good enough? And I'm like, no, you don't get it. I'm so turned on. Stop looking at my erection as the indicator is how aroused I am. So there is a central arousal, which you just described, and a peripheral arousal, which needs to have correct biology to engage in this closed pressurized compartment. If you can't achieve the closed pressurized compartment, despite central arousal, you, you don't have functional peripheral arousal. Right. That's a deeper narrative that I'm bringing to the to the world for women to understand. Uh, and, and we're going to have much deeper discussions about that in future episodes. And I also want to talk about when we go back to the uh, you had some fancy name for it, doctor. <laughs> I try to put it in Lehman's terms. I can't remember exactly what you said, but the the blood work, the the hormones, hypogonadism. So, I mean, it's easy term. Your gonad is, again, your testicle. And you have hypofunction or reduced function of your testicles. So you, your testicle 
for reasons uh, we have to investigate are, are simply not making the testosterone that it normally makes. Right. And one thing I'm really driving home, and there's a spot on my website, and I've, I've coined the term manly numbers. Primarily your testosterone levels, your estradiol levels, your, even your thyroid, thyroid hormones, your T4 and T3 hormones play into how we feel man, manly-wise? Oh, it gets more than that. There's estradiol involved, prolactin is involved. Uh, there's actually a host of hormones that should be assessed in men who have uh, a sexual dysfunction. Well, what I'm trying to drive home to the men is stop being knuckleheads about your health. Men take better care of their cars than they do of themselves. <laughs> and if they would just go out and get a simple blood test, you know, go see a, a, a sexual medicine professional like yourself, get a set of blood tests, but learn what the numbers are. I know what my testosterone levels are. When you you show me my numbers and you show me on the chart and they can go to danielcanfield.com and we have an example of what manly numbers are. And it's like watching the air pressure in your tires. You know, it's an average car should be between 32 and 36 PSI. Guys, you know what that is. You should know what your testosterone high and low levels are and where you are on that. It's not rocket science. Daniel's excellent uh, point. Uh, I just want to bring out that it gets a tiny bit more complicated than simple. You could have testosterone values that are four or 500, yet your testosterone is low. I just want to bring this up. There is a binding protein made by your liver. It has the name Sex Hormone Binding Globulin, and the acronym is SHBG to, to establish Sex Hormone Binding Globulin. Uh, you could have a, a very high Sex Hormone Binding Globulin, which will simply act to take testosterone from its free form into a bound that you cannot use for. So you could have a testosterone of four or 500, uh, which you would seem to be normal. But if your sex hormone binding globin, SHBG, is extremely high for whatever reason, you will have a low free testosterone and the condition of hypogonadism. So it's great to have manly numbers. It's also great to see a doctor and get a complement of hormone blood tests to allow one to assess this in a broader evaluation. Well, and that's my point is go see – nut up men. Go see a doctor. <laughs> The appropriate doctor, like Dr. Goldstein, get some blood tests, that's step one, and all these other things you talked about that are much more complex. I try to keep it a little simpler for the guys, but the bottom line is if they get all these blood tests, all this other information is going to be there. And it, it's really, guys, it's just a blood test. So, so go out and, and do that. And doctor, I, I, I so appreciate the time you spent with me this morning. I know you've got a bunch of uh, more broken boners to probably go heal today. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> You're going to be back on future episodes? I would love to, and it's an honor again. Now, where can they find you? What's your website? So we're at San Diego Sexual Medicine here in San Diego, California. And a fabulous, fabulous, unique and amazing facility to help men and women with sexual health issues learn more about their condition and how to best manage it. That's awesome. And there's also, you've got an entire education corner on our website at danielcanfield.com. They can reach out to you there and reach out to the San Diego Sexual Medicine through that web, through our website as well. So yeah, we have a, a rarely utilized uh, resource, and maybe you could use it yourself, but we have a YouTube channel, which has over 130 YouTubes on it. And it's SD Sexual Med, SD Sexual Med on YouTube. Okay. We'll have that shown up. YouTube interviews. We have a monthly Fox 5 uh, TV series. It's the first uh, Wednesday of every month, and we've collected all of them as YouTube uh, channels for education. SDS for San Diego, Sexual Med, SD Sexual Med. Awesome. Well, Doctor, again, thank you so much. And thank you for doing this, Daniel. It's, uh, and say hi to Stacy for me. <laughs> I shall, and we'll talk soon. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's it for today. I'm totally spent, and people, I need to go take a nap. If you'd like to call and leave a question or comment for the show, 405-592-6637. That's 405-59-BONER. You can find me on Facebook at Broken Boner Radio or danielcanfield.com, or you can even follow me on Twitter at Real Broken Boner. I want to give a shout-out to my production team at podcastfasttrack.com. Carrie, you know I couldn't do this without you. And I can't wait to talk more about my erectile dysfunction with all of you in future episodes. In the meantime, keep it real. 